Hello, hello. Welcome to Conversations with the Wounded Healer. I am your host, Sarah Buino, here as always in my closet. I wonder if I should put pictures of my closet on Instagram. Would that be weird? Do you want to see my closet? It might be weird. Let me know. If you want to see it, I'll post it. Talk about vulnerability. Anyway, I wanted to share with you, I've mentioned this a couple times before, but I'm really trying to embrace this idea of marketing myself and asking for what I need because I'm realizing that, yes, the universe sends me blessings just for being me, but also if I want something, I need to ask for it. So I would like to ask you if you are so inclined to support the podcast financially, you can do that on Patreon. If you're not familiar with Patreon, it's basically a website where you can create a profile as a podcast producer, as an artist, as as just a person, and then people can come and be a patron of your arts, whatever that may be. And so on my Patreon, donations start as little as $1 a month. If you would subscribe at $1 a month, then we get to be friends and you get my undying gratitude. $5 a month gets you into the monthly live discussion. And we've got several lovely women that I get to speak to on a regular basis that I absolutely love. And any more than that, I don't know. I've got to figure out some more shit to give away. But if you would like to subscribe on Patreon in order to support the podcast, I would be so appreciative. Also, you can support the podcast by leaving a review on Apple Podcast, even though it doesn't necessarily do anything to boost ratings on iTunes. Well, iTunes is going away, so I don't know what the fuck they're going to call it later. But anyway, it doesn't do much for that, but it actually lends a bit of credibility. The more reviews that you have, people see like, oh, somebody listens to this. This is important to some people, so I might check it out. So if you would do that, I would be so appreciative. Now onto one of my favorite humans on the planet. And I'm not just saying that. I know I speak in hyperbole often, but Bob Cardi is literally one of my favorite humans on the planet. So Bob Cardi is a retired social worker, supervisor, author, trainer, mentor, and board member who's worked in the addiction, treatment, mental health, criminal justice, and child welfare field. Having over 40 years of experience working in many roles, he sees himself as a counselor interacting with the world around him, but other people saw his role better than he did. Bob Cardi is special to me for so many reasons. I met him... I think I was doing groups at Harborview, which is my favorite treatment center in Chicago. I don't get paid to say that, but it is my favorite because that is where my heart is. And he was the program manager there. And the program manager there before was a mentor of mine. And so I was a little bit like, who is this Bob Cardi? Who does he think he is? You know, I'm always a little like skeptical at first. And even though Bob has a decade more work experience, or a decade, is three decades. Let's be honest here. He's going to listen to this and laugh heartily. He has three decades more experience than I do. He always treated me as an equal. And it just gave me space to kind of like blossom into the therapist that I wanted to be, into the trainer that I wanted to be. I truthfully often think about Bob when I'm making decisions about how to act as a social worker in this career. I really think about what he would do and how he carries himself through the world because he is someone who I don't know that anyone has ever said a negative word about. He's just an amazing human. And so I was so happy to do this interview with him and I have to let you know that the audio might be a little distracting at times. Bob was at my house when we were doing this interview and there was a bunch of construction going on next door. So for both of our mics, I think we're picking up the construction here and there. So please don't be bothered by the distraction, but enjoy my interview with the lovely, amazing, excellent Bob Cardi. Hello, Bob Cardi. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's great to be part of this. I know that we've talked about this for a long time, and mm-hmm. I finally agreed to sit down with you. Yeah, I've only been doing it for a year, so. <laughs> but you've been busy. Yes. Yes, I You've been I very have. busy. So I'll start with telling folks how we met. I think the first time we met was when you became director at Harborview, right? Yes. So Harborview Recovery Center is where I had my internship when I was in grad school and Tony Passioni was the director at the time. 
And when I got into private practice, I wanted to do groups because I love groups. And as soon as I started private practice, I was like, oh, shit, I miss <laughs> I miss <laughs> something that was vitally important to my career. And I think I reached out to you and was like, hey, would you want me to do a group? And you were like, yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It seemed like you know, from some of the things that Tony told me about you, especially around some music therapy things you were doing at the time and just seeing your spirit and stuff, it's like. Yeah, I got to get you on board here. And now it's literally like the favorite thing that I do. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know Bob Cardi, he's a super big deal in Chicago. <laughs> he loves when I say that. But Bob's been in the field for a long time and is probably one of like the most highly respected people I have heard of in our little corner of the world. So no pressure, Bob. Yeah, really. This is going to be really easy. I love that living legend kind of thing that some people throw on me. It's I like, know, right? Uh, what does that feel like? In some ways, I feel like a hero, but I also mm. feel dehumanized in it. Oh, interesting. So it, it is kind of strange. Would you say more about that? You know, it's funny, you know, this topic of wounded healer that we're going to get to for me is so much about the work we do professionally, making it personal, do and being a person in that. Mm -hmm. But when people start kind of saying things like, wow, I, I've always heard about you and I've wanted to meet you, but I've been always afraid to come up to you, like at a conference or something. Oh. It's like, well, why couldn't you just walk up to me? I mean, I don't have an entourage around me keeping people <laughs> away. <laughs> no, you do not. You do no, not. And you're no, definitely I... not an intimidating looking person. You're a very warm looking person. Yeah. So it seemed to in some ways serve as a barrier at times. Mm. The other thing that's strange is I think it's true for most of us where we really only know our own subjective reality and we mm -hmm. don't know exactly how other people see us mm -hmm. until there's an opportunity for this to come back at you. And yeah. when it doesn't quite match my own subjective reality, it feels just a moment of confusion kind of like, wow. Yeah. I didn't think I was a legend. <laughs> <laughs> so we're jumping in right at the get go. And I'm just trying to, I guess, understand more of your subjective experience of yourself. Is it like a self-worth thing that gets in the way of letting yourself take that? What is that? Yeah, there's probably a stew of a number of different ingredients. One of them it might be the self-worth thing, because I've, mm -hmm. you know, often have that inner voice that generates a certain amount of negativity. So I suffer from imposter syndrome just as much as maybe other folks do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an element of it. But I think another element is that I really feel that throughout my more than 40 years of working with alcoholics and addicts, I really always just still saw myself as a counselor. Mm -hmm. I may have been in different roles. I've been supervisor. I've been a deputy director. I've been a clinical director, but I still always saw myself as a counselor. So mm -hmm. I don't think the role I was in became how I was interacting with the world around me. But I think mm. other people may have seen that role instead of who I was. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Well, and I'm guessing that that's why you've been so successful in your role, because if somebody has in their head, well, I'm going to set out to, you know, be a manager and be a leader, there's a certain archetype that goes with that that mm -hmm. may or may not be driven by ego. Whereas when you kind of get thrust into these areas and you're like, well, okay, I'm going to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's like, okay, well, just do this work, hopefully with similar values, but right. from a different perspective. And I think a certain amount of humility is also an important professional value for yeah. us anyway. I mean, we're always taught that we can't take credit for someone else's recovery. So we sort of mm -hmm. hold back on those things. I think you might know this story that I was once awarded a humility award. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and I knew it was common. They let me know that mm -hmm. at this like little breakfast, they were going to give me a humility award. So I joked for like about a month with like, well, what do I do with that? Do I right. come up and brag about how good I am? This is why I'm really <laughs> <laughs> reward. And then uh -huh. they wouldn't let me take it home probably. Right. Or do I do it? Geez, aw, shucks. I don't deserve this. Right. And as fate would have it, I uh, came down with bronchitis that week and didn't even attend the event. So, so humble. You couldn't even show up. Yes. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> well, it's funny. That was the one that I got to the Sierra Tucson oh, Award excellent. a couple of years before that, or maybe one year. I don't remember. But my husband was joking like he's like, they don't really know you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something like I use you as a model for that because I think as my career grows, I want to stay humble. I want to stay connected. I want to be grateful. And I, of course, I just want to find that magic sweet spot of like sitting in it and then everyone will view me as humble. And then, you know, good day, sir. Everything's fine. But it's, I find a struggle between owning my power and promoting myself in an authentic non-ego driven way and being humble you know it's yeah. hard and yet the power is important because you can't take humility to the point of like well i don't see how i can help you because then you're not right. really present there for the individual or the group or whatever you're doing so yeah there's a, a fine balance there yeah and you strike it so beautifully thank you yes Let's rewind a little bit. And I know that there's a million different things you could say about how you got to where you are in your life. But whatever you feel is important to tell people about your journey of becoming a counselor and becoming a therapist, how did you get here? There are a lot of different stories because they're all sort of woven together in some ways. I think for me, a big part of this really happened after I completed my BA in sociology in 1973 and really wanted to just get my first job in the social services. This was back on the East Coast. And I was mm. facing some personal dead ends, just not getting positions. The fact that I had a ponytail down the middle of my back might have had something <laughs> to do with it. Um, but Chicago had the reputation at that time that if you can't find a job in Chicago, you can't find a job anywhere. Really? So, wow. yeah, and I had a buddy who had an apartment up in Rogers Park. So I moved out here just out of faith, wow. thinking, we'll see, maybe I'll work in the social services. And I got a job working with emotionally disturbed kids in residential treatment mm -hmm. and loved it. And for me, at that time, I was uh, about 25 years old. And I think it was a classic to start working with kids because I was just a big kid myself. But I had great supervision there because these kids were in residential treatment for emotional disturbances because mm -hmm. they uh, really were pretty disturbed and needed to be in residential treatment. Mm -hmm. So they certainly could push buttons. And I learned a lot about myself and how to interact with them and how to engage people who sometimes didn't even seem like they wanted to be engaged. So I learned a lot of great basics but I still knew I needed a master's degree. So I went to Jane Addams College of Social Work at UIC mm -hmm. and did a uh, child welfare placement my first year. And my second year, I was interviewing and thinking that I was going to get a nice gig for second year internship because that's always important. And I was turned down by a number. Of, well, I wasn't exactly turned down. I was told that I could work for them as an intern if I cut my ponytail. <gasps> I hate yeah. that. Yeah, really. And this was circa like 1979 by this time. Mm. And I was still kind of taking my stance that, no, my ponytail was part of me and we were not going to part ways. Yes. I was told that there was this uh, hospital-based treatment program for alcoholics at Grant Hospital mm. that was a great placement. So I went there and within a month of working with alcoholics, I knew that I was working where I was supposed to be working. Mm -hmm. So that was September of 1979, 40 years ago. Wow. I was eight months old. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm an asshole. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. That's so awesome. I felt that same way when I started at Harborview, like, oh, these are my people. Yeah. What do you think it is about that population that really speaks to you? I think that there's a kind of honesty about them. You know, some people kind of see it as a roughness, but I kind of like that. I think there's other forms of social services that are just maybe politer, if you will. Yeah, yeah. But I don't mind someone being a little raw with me. I think what was also amazing was starting this work on an inpatient unit back in the days of 28-day programs. Hmm. So we were very creative with the things we did in group. Mm. And really the whole milieu was a 24-7 therapeutic experience. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things I learned in a hurry. There were uh, just wonderful counselors. 
two guys who were clearly mentors in my life, and I absorbed so much. So there was just that feeling of, yeah, I'm in the right place right now. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing they let you keep your ponytail? <laughs> yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah. I always tell students, like, the, one of the reasons I work with people in addiction is because I can cuss. I knew that was a thing I'd be able to do. <laughs> But truthfully, a lot of it is knowing the way that I want to visually represent myself. It certainly wasn't necessarily welcome in working with older adults or other places where I would need to conform a bit more. So I love that you were like, nah, I'm hanging on to this ponytail. Yeah, it was uh, certainly part of my being 29 years old at the time. So Mm -hmm. that was part of it. Mm -hmm. I'm still kind of wondering now in my later years whether it's going to grow back. We'll see. (gasps) Oh, uh, we'll see. I'd love to see a picture of you with a ponytail. I'll have to show you some. <gasps> okay. We won't post it online, though. I promise. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's good. <laughs> so in thinking about the terms healer and wounded healer, I'm sure that you've been knocking these around in your brain. What have you come up with in terms of how those apply or don't apply to yourself? I feel like they do apply. And we'll start with just the term healer. Just because I I really feel while I'm not a healer in the sense of like a shaman, if you will, Mm -hmm. but I am a healer in the sense that I think I bring forth not only what I've been trained to know, but what I've gotten from experience, but then add who I am and my ability to connect with people Mm -hmm. that I can help create an atmosphere in which healing can take place. So that's in the sense where I don't take kind of ownership of the process, but right. that I still engage in a process and then because I'm engaging well, something happens. Right. So I totally accept that. And the thing that might be a little different about this interview, if you want to go there is yes. you know, now that I'm <laughs> <laughs> now that I'm retired, looking at myself as a healer, even though I earlier I said that I keep seeing myself as an addiction counselor, but mm-hmm. now that I'm retired but still doing some training and some mentoring. I still feel that I'm a healer in that process yeah. because there's different ways of still communicating that to people and creating that same kind of environment in which people can learn how to heal others. So I think that's a little different slant that I'm taking into my retirement. The concept of wounded healer, I first heard in the late 80s, and it was very fitting for me because the mid 80s was a time when I went through a divorce and felt in some ways very broken at that time. And I got myself into therapy. This is classic. You know, I was a counselor working with others for about five or six years and then realizing I got to get into therapy myself. Mm. And the therapist recommended adult children of alcoholics. Mm. So I was in ACOA for five years and really worked a lot on understanding who I was through that filter. Mm. And certainly it helped me recognize this idea of promoting some healing for myself so that I can really see myself and grasp this idea of being a wounded healer. And just to take it one step further is after five years in ACOA, I also had the feeling that I was well in touch with my inner child but Mm. didn't know the adult male who I had become Mm. at that point, because now I'm at that point becoming 40 years old. Mm -hmm. So that's about what time the men's movement was popping in this country in the early 1990s. So Mm. I started getting involved in that and got in touch in different ways with what it is to be a a man who's really trying to connect his uh, brain and his heart together which I think took me to another level too, beyond where I was in ACOA. Yeah. Can we dig into that a little bit? So to tell a little history to folks, there was a presentation that we were doing together, you, me, and Meredith. And Meredith and I were doing women and, or no, well, actually the first time it was, I was doing a shame presentation and Brene's initial research was just done with women. And you came up to me and you were like, but what about the men? (laughs) That's exactly how I said it. It is exactly. You sound like that all the time. I need to tell you. Uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> and then we ended up doing this presentation and combining all this together. And I feel like you and my husband are so similar in that mm -hmm. you are very safe men. And I'm curious what you think of this, because the thing that I've come up with is that there are plenty of men in the counseling field who don't feel safe to me. And I don't know if what exactly I'm picking up on, but the difference between that person and someone like you or my husband is I think there's a feminine mm -hmm. understanding of emotion that's very different. And you're not an effeminate person, neither is my husband, but there is mm -hmm. a feminine quality that makes you feel very safe. So I'm curious your thoughts on that about like just men in general getting in touch with that part of themselves and do you have to lose something in order to get to this place of touching your emotion? I don't know. I said a lot of things, but I think you have things to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And actually, I'll start with thanking you for that, because I mean, that's an honor the way you said that. So I do thank you, because I also know what you're describing in Rich, too, because yeah. he certainly brings that energy and he feels like a brother in recovery to me. Mm. So I do think that is about feminine energy. I think somewhat is also, though, about out. And this is in keeping with some of the stuff we've trained together on mm -hmm. uh, in terms of gender socialization patterns, mm -hmm. how men are you know, socialized to be tough. Big boys don't cry. Stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about. Mm -hmm. All of those kinds of things. And girls are taught to be a little more relational. Yeah. And I think one thing that I really pulled out of this is finding a way to be relational with people from still a masculine perspective. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that that has helped me in men's groups, that's mm -hmm. helped me in my own kind of peer support group, that's helped me in having professional relationships with female therapists mm -hmm. that are still respectful and personal. I know that mm -hmm. there are a number of my protégés who are female therapists. Mm -hmm. and. When I first was mentoring people, I was really only mentoring men. And at a certain point, it mm -hmm. seemed very safe for female therapists to describe me as their mentor. And I was mm. OK with accepting that. And that really has only happened in the last five years or so. Really? Well, really. we got together at the right time then. There you go. Yeah. And as you were talking about being able to be relational from a masculine space in that I'm kind of hearing you having cultivated the understanding of who you were as a man, right? Because you talked about knowing the inner child, needing to get to know the man. And then from that place of wholeness, then being able to really connect at an authentic level. Right. I think that is that kind of putting together the brain and the heart. And the fact that I was able to do some inner work on myself made me feel more authentic. Mm -hmm. I know that could be a word that can be overused, but I think that really fits for me here that mm -hmm. I was no longer coming from a needy place to mm -hmm. have people like me, but really be in a place where I felt connected with people. I think that in itself is at the heart of a lot of this. And jumping a little ahead again into my mm -hmm. current situation is being retired now all of about four weeks uh, <laughs> right. is one of the things that certainly happens to many retired, especially men, is that they lose those social networks that they mm -hmm. had at work and maybe in some other places. Mm -hmm. And I've made it a very conscious effort to stay connected with people. And I think that that's really a part of who I am now. It wasn't just part of my work identity. It's part of who I am. Right. I mean, as therapists, if we're not wanting to connect with people all the time, we're probably in the wrong business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we go back to when you decided you were a counselor and you weren't in therapy and you decided to go to therapy? Can I ask, like, I keep telling my students, go the fuck to therapy. It's <laughs> yeah. not an option. But I thought actually back in the 70s, they were not necessarily forcing you to go to therapy, but I thought it was a recommendation. So I'm curious why you didn't go back then. Well, in more like psychoanalytic social services, they were saying that that's mm. part of your training. Now, though, going into this alcoholism unit at Grant Hospital back then, what they recommended was really go into a number of AA meetings mm -hmm, just to mm -hmm. kind of see what that was about, open AA meetings. Right. So it really did give me a chance to get that kind of understanding, but it's much more of an understanding of AA than an understanding of myself. 
Right. And it was only after I was starting to really kind of not only have some years of clinical experience, but then go through this personal confusion and frustration and sort of kind of really crashing and burning a little bit uh, before getting ready to build myself up again. That was really pretty much where I was. It was really flight of the phoenix in the mid 80s Mm. for me that I knew that the kind of rules and they probably were rules I was living by Mm -hmm. just wasn't fitting for anymore. Maybe that's how I got through college and through my 20s. But at 35, that wasn't cutting it anymore. If you don't mind going there, what were some of those rules? Well, uh, one real obvious one was Bob Cardi. Forgive me for identifying myself in the third person, Mm -hmm. but Bob Cardi is not the kind of person who would get a divorce. Yeah. And I kind of believe that and kept me Mm -hmm. in a marriage that was not a good marriage, I believe. Mm -hmm. It had some wonderful things in it, Mm -hmm. but for me, it wasn't where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I could kind of realize that I need to take a second look at that to understand why I was living with that rule. A number of other kinds of things about who I could trust and who I couldn't trust. Mm. I think people who I trusted at that point in time was a very, very tight circle. So I think it really reflected my own mistrust of the world I was living in. I really reflect now of where I am, you know, 40 years later, a little less than that, I guess, now from that position and recognize I have so many different circles of wonderful friends because I opened up to the world a lot more. Mm -hmm. I remember, as a matter of fact, this just popped in my head as we're talking about that therapy in the mid 80s for me. I remember my therapist talking to me about my worldview was that the world is one of scarcity. There wasn't enough out there. So I had to hold on and protect whatever I had, because if I let go of it, who knows if I'd get anything back. And it took me years to get over that and recognize that that was really a mindset. That was a rule I was carrying Mm -hmm. around, a narrative I was living. And it was Mm -hmm. really became a world of bounty. I mean, the ability to reflect now over the past 40 years Mm -hmm. and this career and the friends I've made and the work that's been done and how I've grown. I mean, I've lived in the world of bounty the last 40 years now. Yeah. And that's one of the things I feel like I end up talking a lot about on this podcast is the way that society and American values have shaped us, misshapen even us in, I'm going to say the wrong direction. I don't really like to say right or wrong, Mm. but I am certainly not the only person to have said, you know, this country is suffering, I think, at the hand of striving and When you're striving and competing, that is a scarcity model rather than an abundance model. Right. And there are consequences to that. Right. And we see that in so many different ways. Yeah. Well, I feel like I have a handful of clients who their story is really one of like golden handcuffs, right? Where they they get on the Mm -hmm. treadmill, they get that great job, they get that family, they get those kids, they do those things. And then they wake up one day and they're like, oh, shit, this is not what I wanted. And a lot of times that's when addiction manifests and addiction seems to be this like really passive aggressive way of blowing up one's life when you can't just make that decision to step off the treadmill because that's not what our society allows us to do. Right. Because it's almost that, you know, if you're sort of retiring from the game and then by retiring, I'm not talking about the retiring after a career, but you're dropping out of the game. You know, you're a loser. You're just not playing by the rules or all those other kinds of messages that Mm -hmm. I think guys get and women as well. Yeah. But especially men, like this was, I think the reason that Rich stayed in a career that wasn't Mm. suiting him for nearly 20 years. He worked at the same company for 18 years and that is unheard of in this day and age. (laughs) Yeah. And a lot of it was fear. Much of it was also like, I don't know what to do with my life, but also fear of what happens if I step off that treadmill of success, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a lot of fear there. Yeah. Given your ability to kind of like look back at how the world has changed, I'm curious your view of where we are right now. My therapist is is your age. And so I'm always like, Susan, tell me it's going to be OK <laughs> because you've been around the block and you've seen bad things happen before. I'm just curious kind of your thoughts of what do you think of the state of the world? Really small insignificant question that you have to have (laughs) the right answer to. (laughs) Nice. Good. I think I could answer this in 25 words or less. Right. I think this is where my inner Buddhist comes out. Yay. 
Yeah, really. I mean, clearly there's a lot of darkness in our world right now, but the light that counters that is all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, the community organizing that's coming to push back in some of the things politically is just one Mm -hmm. example. And I don't mean to turn this into a political argument. It's cool. I'm pretty sure everyone who listens is liberal. (laughs) (laughs) So that's that's one element. But, Mm -hmm. you know, the other element, too, is that And maybe it's part of our work, too. You know, we've seen people in the throes of addiction or in throes of family members, also in throes of their loved one's addiction, be in incredible dark places, but see them come through it. And hanging out with a lot of volunteers that I've worked with over the years, especially at Hazel and Betty Ford, is that there's just so many wonderful reminders how people get through the very darkest and come back really strong. So Mm -hmm. I remain very hopeful about this. I really do. I Mm -hmm. think that what we have is some challenges ahead. I mean, there's, again, a lot of evidence of it. I mean, higher rates of suicide. Yeah. We're at a time when actually the life expectancy is declining instead of increasing. Mm. So there's a lot of like scary things out there. But I also believe that we can get through the darkness. Yeah. What I always talk about with patients, especially at Harborview when I do the groups is at the end of the day on your deathbed, you're not going to say, oh, I wish I would have made more mm-hmm. money or I yeah. wish I would have worked harder. It's regrets about relationship. And a lot of what I heard you just share there were micro experiences of connection. And that is where we find happiness, right? All right. Yeah, I was just going to throw in an example that you witnessed. You know, about five weeks ago, Hazel and Betty Ford Chicago threw me a retirement party. They did. And it was like an incredible event for me. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people in the room. Yes. Because what started out is just a roast of me, which I I could accept because I could laugh at myself as well as anyone else can. Got very emotional. And Mm -hmm. there were a lot of tears flowing, mine and yours. Mine, yes. Uh (laughs) Yeah. And it was interesting for me because... At one point, since on the agenda, I saw that I was supposed to give like some closing goodbye Mm -hmm. speech, which I didn't know about until I was sitting down at that surprise party. So I remember for a while trying to collect my thoughts as to what I would say, but I was so overwhelmed by emotions and the feedback that people were giving me Mm -hmm. that my brain just turned off in that way. And I just absorbed it. And I just allowed myself to cry and be present and had the faith that when I stood up, I'd know what to say. And this goes back to the darkness thing, because some of those tears, I know we can say were tears of joy, but they hurt. They really did hurt. There was some pain there. And it wasn't pain about leaving these good people who had a lot of nice things to say about Mm. me. And maybe this was inner child stuff again. There was kind of like, wow, people really recognize that I was in here working as hard as I can and that I really did influence a lot of people. And it was, on one hand, a wonderful affirmation. And on the other hand, it was also a reminder of all the work that went into that. Yeah. And that just made me tear up a little bit. (laughs) And I think why I cried that day, I was I was surprised actually how much I cried because like I said to you at the end, like I know I'm going to see you again. This is not right. this right. is not goodbye. I think we've spoken about this before. There's a shift, especially in our little field here in Chicago, where a lot of great people are retiring, and my generation is not necessarily ready to fill your shoes. Not because we're not talented, but because we don't have the experience. And so there's fear. There's fear Mm. of who is going to take over and here we go. Who's going to take care of us? Who's going to take care of me? You know, I've definitely found as I grow in my leadership role, it's scary. It's really scary. And I can only imagine how it feels for you to have held all of that, all of that fear, my fear, Vanessa's fear, all the people you've mentored along the way to hold that. And it's not unlike when my parents died, I felt untethered was the word that yes. I said, because it yes. felt like there was nothing above me to stop me from going into the ether, you know? Yeah, I totally get that. I think that's really well said too. And on top of that, because you are a leader here and you're taking on more and more leadership things. So there's part of that thing of, well, people are looking up to me. Can I do this? Right. And And I have to do it right and perfectly and not hurt anybody. Yeah. All that perfection (laughs) comes up. Yeah. I totally get that. 
Oh, man. Because, yeah, no one's going to ever fill your shoes. Well, I don't know that that's true. There will be great people, but this is going to be a love fest because you're just you're <laughs> you're a very special person. And I'm actually curious because I always I always say about Rich, I don't think that there's ever been a person in the world who's met Rich who didn't like him. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. And I'm very curious if you have ever like actually not been liked by someone. Oh, wow. Boy, this is a good story to stick into a wounded Ooh. healer thing. <laughs> I was fired for insubordination once. <gasps> you were not. <laughs> yes, I was. So I, <gasps> Tell I certainly me had everything. I certainly had a supervisor who didn't like me very much. This was my last days at Grant Hospital. So somewhere around 1988, Grant Hospital was bought out by a for-profit healthcare mm. corporation that believed that the only way that they could stay for profit is make sure that every unit of the hospital made mm. money. And that also meant that if there were some openings in the position because someone left, we'll keep those openings open as long as we can, because Ugh. if you can't control the dollars coming in, you can at least control the dollars going out. Wow. So there was an open position in the evening IOP that was pushing real hard to get filled. And someone was in there just on a temporary basis who was not given a you know, all the benefits that go with full-time employment that mm. I was really pushing hard literally for weeks to get filled. And this person was in a staff meeting and said some things that he probably shouldn't have said, but it was a staff <laughs> meeting. Mm -hmm. And my supervisor was in the room and told me right thereafter that I had to write him up for that. Mm. And I said that this was a staff meeting. He was expressing himself, getting frustration out. That's what counselors do. We need a place. Oh, yeah to circle up and just let it out instead of hold it back. She was not in agreement with that. And the next day she came to my office and told me that I was fired for insubordination and she had security walk me off the unit. Wow. And so some people didn't like me. I think in hindsight, you can look back and do you think that was actually about you or was that like her ego? Well, it was organizational politics. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was her ego because I had been at Grant Hospital once for six years. I left and came back for eight years. So I had a certain amount of wow. formal authority, but informal authority with my team. And she had been there all of about a year. So <gasps> wow, there was, uh, that's some bullshit. Some, yeah. <laughs> I do also <laughs> consider this the Dennis Rodman factor. Actually, I said 88. This had to be 98. This is 1998 uh -huh. because that's when Dennis Rodman was with the Bulls. And, of course, mm -hmm. being a rebel that he was, uh, my son accused me of trying to pretend I was Dennis Rodman. <laughs> Did you still have a ponytail? Uh, no. No, mm -hmm. that had been gone. No. Oh. <laughs> that would have really upset her. Wow. That's interesting. We'll have to see in, in Rich's therapy career <laughs> if anything goes down like that. But there you go. he did tell me that like he had one playground fight when he was like seven or something like ah. that. <laughs> 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 so what are you going to do in your retirement? That's the biggest question ever. Oh, well, there, I guess there's a story to tell in that too. So I retired about a month ago and the very next day I started thinking, I don't want to waste time in my retirement. I just don't mm. want to kill time. I, I mm -hmm. want to use this as an opportunity. So I started thinking about the things that I wanted to occupy my week with, not necessarily doing all these things the same day, but make sure I bring this into my week. Mm -hmm. So one of them was increasing my physical workouts because I want to get in a little better shape. Another one was I've always been a student. I love to read and mm -hmm. I want to keep learning more and more about our profession. I mean, mm -hmm. you've moved me in some wonderful directions and some readings like around self-compassion and stuff. So I want to stay active on that. Right now I'm reading some stuff about trance, which is very kind of fascinating stuff. I'm not even that sure how I'm going to use it, but it's great stuff. Trance? So, yeah, trance. The uh -huh. book's called Trances people live. Yeah, Stephen, I'm going to blank on the name. Name retrieval here is part of retirement. Right. Starts with a W. But anyway, so reading and keep studying, that's another thing that was yeah. a part of me. I've started playing guitar. As a matter of fact. <gasps> no, really? 
Yes, yes. Yesterday was my first guitar lesson. I bought the cu- guitar a few months ago, but I've been sort of taking lessons on YouTube. But this was a real teacher, so I'm back being a student. So I'm now a guitar student. I love this. Thank you. Thank you. Please, can I come to your first recital? <laughs> you being a singer, that that's great. That's be perfect. Yes, we'll do a duo. Nice. And then the fourth area was some writing. I've been journaling mm. for at least 30 years, and I'm still not quite sure what I'm going to do with my journaling, mm. but I want to keep journaling and I want to maybe do some creative writing. Yeah. Would you write a book? Uh, possibly. I don't know. I really don't know. I See, I don't want this to be necessarily work, and this actually yeah. gets to the point of the story, I think. So I came up with those four things. And I noticed right away, too, that all those were solitary things. Mm. And since I talked about being relational and want to get people in my life, I thought, well, every week I have to have some social connections. Mm -hmm. Like, as a matter of fact, what we're doing right now is part of me getting out of the house and having social connections. Mm -hmm. So I had those five things in mind. And now me still being maybe a little OCD here decided, well, I'll make Mm -hmm. a grid of those five (laughs) columns. (laughs) <laughs> and dates and put it all out there to see that I'm staying Aww. accountable to my plan. Yeah. So I brought this up into my men's group next Thursday after I did this, knowing exactly how silly this sounded. Mm-hmm. So once again, yeah. I have to get my vulnerability. Exactly. I just put it out there. And one of my dear friends in the group said something I think very wise. He said, You know, it sounds to me that you've just finished a very successful career and you're trying to have a successful retirement. Mm. Yeah, that really stuck with me because it's interesting. That's an absolute true statement, but I don't have to use the same skills that I used in my work identity to have a successful retirement. Wow, that is a truth bomb. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I hope that when I get to retirement age, I kind of have this thing in my head that I'm never going to retire. And I don't think that's healthy. (laughs) What you're explaining sounds like, yeah, I would need a plan. I would need to schedule that shit. I would need to accomplish something and absolutely have some sort of success in retirement. So that scares the shit out of me. (laughs) Wow. Well, thankfully, the years to come will maybe help you look at that in some Mm -hmm. other different ways as well, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's hope. Never stop going to therapy. (laughs) As a number of people have asked, too, you know, am I still going to train? And it's like, yeah, I I love to train. So that doesn't even feel like I'm retiring from training. Yeah. I think I was retiring from commuting to a full-time job is what I was retiring from. Yeah, yeah. I've also been joking with some people that I'm not retiring, I'm rebooting. (laughs) I like that. Well, if anyone is listening in the Chicago area and you are a therapist, make sure that if you see Bob Cardi's name on one of those little trillion things that come in the mail about trainings, make sure that you do go see Bob because he is a very excellent speaker, mentor, teacher, clinician, all of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well... I'm hungry. I don't know about you. So I kind (laughs) of want to wrap this up so we can go eat some lunch. But before we go, is there anything that we didn't talk about that you would really like to share with listeners today? Well, we covered so much. This actually even felt like a therapy session at some point in time, Mm. I think, Uh, which is good. I think the word that sticks with me is blessings. Mm -hmm. We can get so caught up in the daily operations of what we have to do is that we might lose sight of the bigger picture and the blessings that we have in even being allowed to do this work. Mm -hmm. I know you've said on other podcasts, and I really have to echo that here, is to really be able to do the work, you have to do your own work as well, too. Mm -hmm. So blessings come from that as well. But I know when I started really working on myself, there was a qualitative shift in the work that I did. Mm -hmm. And I think it opened up a whole new world for me. And I wish that for all your listeners. A whole new world. (laughs) Too bad I don't have my guitar with me. I got a few. Damn. If I'd have known, we'd have prepared. There you go. Well, Bob, thank you so, so, so much. I'm really excited to share your wisdom with more people in the world. Thank you, Sarah. I'm glad we did this. Me too. Bob, thank you so, so much for being on the show. 
And if you want to learn more about Bob, you can't because he's retired. He doesn't want to talk to anybody anymore. (laughs) Truthfully, though, Bob is an amazing human and just be grateful to have heard his wisdom on this podcast. So thanks as always to Andrea Clunder and the team at the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. Please connect with us online at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast or Spotify or Instagram or Twitter or wherever the hell you want to hang out because I think you're awesome. Have a great day. Till next time. Mm